This individual goes by the name Ronald Cotton. Close to three decades ago, he stood in a North Carolina courthouse within the United States. The jury took less than an hour to declare Ronald as guilty. This verdict effectively cleaved Cotton's life into two segments. The time he spent as a free man and the duration he would endure behind bars. Consequently, he received a life sentence. It's astonishing to consider the circumstances that led to such a severe judgment for a 20-year-old man. The year was 1984. During the night, an unidentified attacker forcibly entered the apartment of student Jennifer Thompson. The assailant subjected her to sexual assault. Shortly after, she managed to flee and seek medical attention at the hospital. During that very night, Jennifer provided a detailed statement to the police, meticulously describing the appearance of the rapist. She retained a strong memory of his face. Law enforcement swiftly apprehended a suspect, Ronald Cotton. He was employed in proximity to the location of the crime, had encountered legal issues during his teenage years, and his alibi failed to align. Yet, the most pivotal aspect was Jennifer's initial identification of Ronald from a photograph. Subsequently, she identified him in person within the courtroom. This led to Cotton's conviction. Regrettably, there existed a significant problem. Ronald Cotton was entirely innocent. This case is history forever. You will, of course, learn about how and why it happened. But it's not just the story of a criminal case. This video is about our memories, people, events, phenomena, images, and details. However, much of what we remember never happened. In this video, there won't be just one crime story, but three. These incidents unfolded at varying times and even across different continents. Yet, they share a common theme, false memories. These are instances that either never occurred or transpired differently from our recollection. This is exemplified by an event in 1984 within the modest American town of Bellingham. The setting was a balmy evening in July. Jennifer, a college student, was in slumber within her residence. A figure of a man was rapidly advancing toward her bed. In the ensuing moments, she sensed the chilling presence of a knife blade against her throat. Jennifer attempted to negotiate with the intruder, offering money, valuables, and even her car. The man refused. It was at this juncture that Jennifer comprehended the impending danger. After she recalled that at that moment, she decided to fully concentrate on the appearance of the rapist. That very night, at the hospital, she furnished the police with a comprehensive account of the incident, including intricate details of the events. Additionally, during that same night, another attempted rape occurred within the vicinity. In this instance, the intended victim managed to repel the assailant. The composite sketch produced from this second case resembled Ronald. Notably, Ronald had already encountered legal trouble during his teenage years, involving burglary and assault. Jennifer's testimony became the pivotal point of contention. She singled him out from a group of six suspects in a photograph. Ronald received word from relatives that the police were seeking him in connection with rape allegations. Firmly believing in his own innocence, he voluntarily visited the police and recounted his activities on that particular night. However, he never left the police station, as he was never released. The prosecution had amassed substantial evidence against him. The decisive factor was an experiment. Jennifer was presented with seven individuals who roughly fit the description of the assailant. Sequentially, each of them spoke, and at the conclusion, the victim confidently singled out the fifth suspect. This person was Ronald Cotton. Despite the defendant's unwavering claims of innocence, the jury found the prosecution's arguments, primarily the victim's testimony, to be persuasive. Her identification of Cotton during the trial further solidified this conviction. She asserted that he was the intruder who had entered her residence on that fateful night in July. The defendant was sentenced to life imprisonment along with an additional 50 years. Jennifer Thompson felt a sense of contentment. 
she firmly believed that the man responsible for the heinous crime would spend the remainder of his life behind bars. Yet, as you already know, Ronald Cotton was innocent. However, the cause behind this was neither a conspiracy nor a plot. It was simply that the vividly precise recollections of the victim were based on events that had never actually occurred. While incarcerated, Ronald Cotton collaborated with his lawyer to secure a new hearing. In prison, he spotted a man resembling the police sketch used for his conviction. This man, Bobby Poole, shared the same hometown as Cotton and was imprisoned for rape. Despite Poole denying the rape of Jennifer Thompson, Cotton remained skeptical. A new hearing was arranged with Cotton, Poole, and Thompson present. Spoiler, Cotton was right. Poole was the real rapist. Surprisingly, Thompson failed to recognize Poole in court and reaffirmed Cotton's presence during the crime. He was reconvicted, receiving two life sentences this time. Seven years later, the highly publicized O.J. Simpson trial captivated the United States as the former soccer star stood accused of killing his wife, despite widespread belief in Simpson's guilt. He was acquitted. He trial turned into a reality show that was watched all over the country, including in the prison where Ronald Cotton was sitting. Upon learning about DNA during a televised broadcast, Ronald contacted a lawyer who cautioned against relying solely on DNA testing due to potential lack of evidence. Despite the risks, Ronald pursued this avenue. Archives at the police station contained evidence from the 1984 crime, including a DNA sample from the actual perpetrator. 11 years later, Ronald Cotton's innocence was proven. But questions remain. What if the girl was simply mistaken? Given the resemblance between Cotton and Poole, it's entirely possible. Plus, let's not forget the victim's stress level. It could be an unfortunate but isolated incident. What does false memory have to do with it? Fair argument. Here's another case. Meet Steve Titus, a 31-year-old restaurant manager near Seattle. In 1980, after a celebratory dinner, he was pulled over by a police officer due to his car resembling that of a rape suspect from earlier that day. Steve was arrested and shown to the victim, who identified him as the most resembling the attacker. Despite his plea of innocence, the court convicted him based on her testimony. Steve persisted contacting journalists for help. Eventually, a journalist uncovered the true perpetrator, responsible for nearly 50 similar rapes nearby. Steve was exonerated, but the aftermath was harsh, losing his job, savings, and fiance due to the ordeal. He faced depression and decided to sue the local police. Compensation, possibly reaching a record amount at the time, several million dollars was on the horizon. Sadly, shortly before the court hearing, Stephen Titus passed away from a heart attack at the age of 35. Again, we observe a familiar pattern a victim's unwavering certainty in court led to the accusation of an innocent man due to her false memory. This phenomenon isn't limited to crime victims or witnesses. It's more widespread. People's recollections of breaking a vase as a child or cheating on tests can also be false memories. However, the consequences are less dire in those cases. The judicial system heavily relies on witness testimony but what happens when memories prove to be unreliable? We'll delve into the reasons behind this shortly. Now, let's explore a third and arguably the most captivating story. This time, it's 1985. It all began in the suburbs of the American Cleveland. An ordinary Ford plant employee, a law-abiding husband and father, suddenly faced police accusations of being a violent Nazi criminal. Supposedly, during the Second World War, he allegedly served as a guard in a concentration camp, participating in the murder of numerous Jews. Known for extreme cruelty, he earned the nickname Ivan the Terrible. Following the war, a department called the Special Investigations Department was established in the U.S. Its primary mission was to locate former Nazi collaborators who had immigrated to the U.S., obtained asylum, and concealed their wartime activities. According to investigators, 
Ivan Yuk, originally from Ukraine, adopted the Americanized name John Demian Yuk upon immigrating. He was eventually identified by survivors of concentration camps from old photographs. Since he hadn't committed crimes on U.S., soil, or against American citizens, he couldn't be tried in the U.S. He was deported to Israel for trial, captivating the entire nation. The trial's significance was immense. A guilty verdict would lead to the death penalty. In 1987, the trial commenced. The prosecution's argument rested on Demian Yuk, alleged role as a guard at Poland's Treblinka concentration camp, supported by a surviving German certificate featuring a photo, and the name Ivan Demian Yuk, bearing a striking resemblance to the accused. Crucially, the prosecution relied on several surviving concentration camp prisoners who identified Demian Yuk as the sadistic guard nicknamed Ivan the Terrible. This moniker was earned through his gruesome actions including pushing victims into gas chambers. Demian Yuk adamantly denied all allegations. His defense contended that the certificate was fabricated, highlighting inconsistencies in the stamp and photo. The involvement of the State Security Committee in organizing the issuance of certificates to anti-Soviet immigrants added another layer of complications. Notably, the documents were acquired by the U.S. from the Soviet Union. Furthermore, even if one were to consider the documents valid, Demian Yuk had indeed served as a guard in other Polish camps. So Bybor and Troniki, but not in Treblinka. The photo on the certificate bore a resemblance Demian Yuk, yet nearly 40 years separated the two images, making positive identification uncertain. The trial's trajectory underscored the pivotal role of witnesses and their memories, which hinge on events four decades prior. This marked the onset of the trial's gripping drama. Witnesses recounted horrific details of Nazi atrocities at the concentration camp, causing emotional reactions from the audience. Each witness identified the accused in court as Ivan, the terrible from the Polish camp, Treblinka. However, the situation is more complex. Some Treblinka witnesses initially didn't recognize Deminiuk's photos, but later identified him in court. Moreover, documents from 1945 emerged, stating that Ivan the Terrible was killed during the Treblinka uprising. The document's author, a witness, later claimed in court that the accused was the guard known as Ivan the Terrible. A year later, Ivan Demianyuk was sentenced to death, though his lawyers appealed. Amid global changes like the Berlin Wall's fall and the collapse of socialist states, Demianyuk's lawyers gained access to Treblinka documents. These records revealed that Ivan the Terrible might have been Ivan Marchenko, not Demian Yuk. Physical differences emerged, like eye color, contradicting witness testimonies. In 1993, Israel's Supreme Court overturned the death sentence, citing strong doubts about Demian Yuk's role at Treblinka. The court rejected the accuracy of witnesses who claimed to have seen Demian Yuk at Treblinka, highlighting the concept of false memories. Demianyuk's 1993 story didn't conclude then. After Israel's Supreme Court decision, he returned to the U.S., regaining citizenship and a quiet life. Investigations persisted, aiming to link Demianyuk to other Nazi camps. In 2009, aged almost 90, he faced trial in Germany for alleged involvement in Sobiber and Trevniki. Despite his age and health, he was brought to trial from his home in a wheelchair sparking discussions about his ability to endure the journey. The police presented video evidence showing Demian Yuk's mobility, contrary to his wheelchair use claims. His trial, a notable global event just over a decade ago, stirred differing opinions. Some saw an elderly man mistreated, while others thought he aimed to appear as an innocent martyr. In 2011, a German court convicted the 91-year-old of aiding in the murder of thousands of Jews. During the appeal, Demianyuk was sent to a nursing home where he died. Under German law, a person who does not live to hear an appeal is presumed innocent. This story is intriguing, but the crucial detail for our discussion is that the German court found Demianyuk guilty of Sobiber camp involvement, not as Ivan the Terrible at Treblinka. This underscores the concept of false memories recollections of events that didn't occur or transpired differently. 
As discussed in the video, DNA testing has revolutionized crime solving while revealing the unreliability of our memories. A U.S. study showcased nearly 300 wrongly accused individuals who spent years in prison before Denna vindicated them. Most convictions were based on witnesses or victims' false memories. This raises questions. How and why does this occur? While we understand memory's quirks, forgetting or confusing minor details, it seems implausible to mistake one person for another, especially in recent events. But consider this. What if your memory could swiftly replace a face seen moments ago? Now, let's test your memory. Several faces will appear. Remember them. Now, which man among two shown have you seen before? Left or right? Great, you've answered. For the final test, three pairs of men will appear on the screen, and you will identify those that were in the first memory test, right or left. Here we go. Results time. In the last phase, you viewed this pair of men. Likely, most of you chose correctly. The man on the left was from your initial memory. The next picture led you to select the man on the right, which you probably got right too. Now, for the last picture, you saw these two men. Now comes the intriguing part. When this same test was given to a sizable audience at Harvard University during a lecture, Opinions about the last two men were almost evenly divided. Roughly half of the audience was mistaken. The accurate answer was the man on the right. It's probable that many of us, like those at Harvard, made the same mistake, confusing a face we had just seen a few minutes prior. Don't forget to share your test results in the comments. Let's see how many of you passed turned out to be right. The secret of this test is as follows. There was an intermediate stage between the first and last stage of the test. First, you saw this couple, and most people immediately remembered the right man. And then, this photo. Neither of these men were in the original photos, and the additional information in between caused many people to confuse the man in the final test. And this phenomenon isn't due to a poor memory or lack of attention. The shift in memories occurred due to something between the first and final stages. Misinformation. If you previously thought that false information from media or others could only impact our perception of events, we weren't part of. The reality is even more concerning. Misinformation can warp our memories of events we experienced, even creating false memories. The implantation of false memories is entirely feasible and doesn't require any specialized technology. Over the past decade, psychologists and scientists have conducted numerous experiments showcasing this fact. A renowned expert in this field is Professor Elizabeth Loftus. You can find several of her lectures on YouTube for more insight. In these lectures, she illustrates how false memories can be introduced. For instance, an experiment involving American soldiers subjected them to intensive interrogations for around half an hour. Following the interrogation, psychologists gradually convinced them that the interrogator looked different than they initially remembered. In the end, all the soldiers then agreed that they had been interrogated by the man. Of course, it was only a false memory. Do you know what the person who did the interrogation actually looked like? They're completely different people. How can they be confused? Indeed, the experiment with soldiers emphasizes that even in a stressful situation, false memories can be embedded. Stress may play a role, but it is not the only one. Other examples confirm this. Scientists have managed to implant various false memories, including negative ones, such as getting lost in a shopping mall, suffering a dog bite or drowning, as well as positive ones, such as heroic deeds. The implantation was subtle and began by collecting authentic incidents from a person's life through their relatives. Then, using this information to convince subjects of the reality of events that never happened. It is important to note that the researchers were successful in about half of the cases, which is significant. 
Given today's era of mass misinformation, it is alarming that such information can alter our personal memories. Even more disturbing is how the brain is involved. In one of the aforementioned experiments, participants were placed in an MRI machine to observe the brain's response to true memories versus false memories that had been implanted earlier. What they discovered was fascinating. Our brain largely accepts false memories as real. While there were slight differences in brain activity, false memories became convincing for the brain's gray matter. Jennifer Thompson, even years after the real rapist's conviction, found that her memory hadn't replaced Cotton's face with the real perpetrators, but instead turned it into an indistinct blur over time. This may have been due to misinformation during the lineup, as there was no real perpetrator among the photos of the suspects. As a result, her brain memorized the most appropriate face. This phenomenon could have also occurred with witnesses in Demianyuk, Israeli trial, influenced by their traumatic experiences. It's crucial to note that this doesn't invalidate Demianyuk guilt in other camps. The point remains, we used to envision memory as a pristine archive of films or hard drives, which we retrieve to recall something accurately. However, in reality, memory is like a long ruined archive, with most recordings missing or replaceable with fakes. So what's the solution? Verify. It's essential to cross-check others' memories, and even our own at time. That's all for today. If you liked this video, don't forget to subscribe. Bye.